You have questions, we have answers. This is Jane Muller. And this is Ken Muller. Welcome to our show, all about real estate with Ken and Jane. Today, Jane, we're going to continue with our special guest, AJ Kumar, who's a CPA. Uh, last week's show, for the listeners that missed it, we covered a lot of interesting topics about real estate accounting. We just sort of like touched upon it, though. We got into the principal residence, the New Jersey exit tax. Um, we didn't get to cover a lot of other things that we really that the listeners are, are have a lot of uh, questions about, namely investment properties, 1031 exchanges. So um, let's. Uh, so we've invited AJ to come back, and AJ, thank you again for t- taking time. Absolutely, out of, my pleasure for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Again, what we're saying on this broadcast is meant as general uh, information. If anybody has any specific questions, they always must consult their uh, individual accountant. And uh, for for those listeners that need an accountant, AJ, why don't you tell us about your firm and how people can reach you? Uh, Absolutely. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jan. So, Science CPA Services is the company name. My name is AJ Kumar, CPA. I have been practicing for over 25 years now. We have three locations in US. Uh, we have 38 accountants, seven CPAs, right from business startup. We do bookkeeping, payroll, sales tax, annual tax, and wealth planning. I have four years degree in computer, MBA in finance from NYU, a CPA degree, 37 and 366 wealth planning licenses. When working with Science CPA services, you have one point of contact for all your tax and accounting needs. I'm happy to be here. Let's talk about investment properties, 1031 exchange, and SBA EID loan. How do we use the SBA loans to invest into real estate? Let's talk about self-directed IRA. Can we invest the retirement funds into the real estate. Oh. Wow. Yeah, let's, that's, that's, let's, <laughs> let's at least try to cover as many of those topics uh, as we can. Otherwise, we'll have to have you back every week. <laughs> <laughs> yes. right, right. So investment properties, they say with real estate, uh, the beauty of it is it's it's a solid investment. It's normally, considered, it's normally considered to be passive income, meaning that the IRS looks at it as passive as capital gains. I know that you... you I know a little bit about the fact that if you're considered a real estate professional, unless you fall into that category, most investors, the tax, the tax, it's taxes, capital gains, and it's not subject to, you know, you're not considered unless you're a real estate professional and you devote so many hours, like 500 or 750 hours a year, and you you meet all these other criteria. But let's assume, um, let's talk about the benefits. of buying an investment property and being a landlord and what the how you how the repairs and the improvements and the um, HOA dues and the and the property taxes and the mortgage interest how those how those all how the, you derive a tax benefit as the landlord uh, absolutely great point Ken and as you rightly said investment property is a solid investment the the stock market can go up and down but we know. There is something you can touch, You something you can feel when it comes to the investment property. Investment properties are typically considered safer investment as opposed to any other investment that you have out there in terms of stock market options, Bitcoin. There are a plethora of those, those things. But when it comes to the, st- the real estate transaction, people feel safer about it. And there are a lot of tax benefits around it. Uh, anything that you spend on that property in terms of repair, maintenance, fixing, they're all tax deductible expenses. Uh, Your mortgage interest is tax deductible. Property tax, on your primary home, there is a cap on sold. You cannot deduct more than 10,000 of state and local taxes. When it comes to the investment property, everything is tax deductible. You have an apartment uh, building complex and you pay property tax of 32,000. Guess what? 32,000 is tax deductible. So anything that you see on the investment side, including the depreciation, the main thing is depreciation here. You can have, uh, depending on what type of property you have, if it's a residential property versus commercial property, you can have 27.5 years of depreciation or 39 years of depreciation. But consider a large amount of money that's not going out of your pocket. It's not cash going out, it's just tax deductible. In most rental situation, we don't see any profit. Uh, the bottom line profit is typically zero once you take out the property tax, mortgage inter- interest, repairs, insurance, utility, travel, all of these categories. As long as we typically tell our clients, close your eyes 
any expense yeah. that you wouldn't have had. Right, even cleaning, pest control. Uh, uh, absolutely. Pests, even the loan, forms, the, the, loan the, maintenance. The, yeah, loan maintenance. So it's amazing, the maintenance and repairs. And I think it's a little bit different if you have to replace a washing machine or dryer or dishwasher, I think. But even then, you get it's like a capital improvement. Or, and, and then there's some you, there's some deductibility. It's just, it's just categorized differently, right? There's a useful Ooh. life maybe you could talk about. Uh, absolutely. So if you have a uh, washing machine and if it's costing you $400, we would not capitalize it. If you have changing the roof on an investment property and it costed you $10,000, we will capitalize it. Then we'll see what's the life of the roof. In case of roof, we'll add it to the residential property's value. But let's say if you have capital investment uh, uh, fixing the loan, which will have three to five years of life, then you can do a cost segregation study. A cost segregation study cost money. It can cost anywhere from two to five thousand dollars. So you have to be cost conscious about it. You have to really see is it worth investing a couple of thousand dollars into cost segregation study. But once you do the cost segregation study on your investment property, let's say if you buy a motel, then the whole building is not depreciated over 39 years. There are certain things, the loan maintenance, which will not last more than five years. Uh, the rooms will have to be repainted every three years, every four years. The beds are not going to last for 39 years. So there are a lot of things that you can segregate in different life cycle and then create more depreciation as opposed to just using the straight line depreciation. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's wow, very that's important. I mean, I, I never thought about it. Just like, I mean, if you, if you buy, if you invest in the floor, for example, if you put a new carpet, if you put a, a you know, new type of floor, I think that typically is a five to seven years or something. Uh, yes, or, yes, yeah. seven years is the, is the safe bet for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And just let's, let, let's touch a little bit further on the depreciation. From what I understand, basically, the depreciation, if, if you're on a 27.5 year for residential or 39 year for commercial that means basically if you look at the charts every year you can deduct if it's let's say it's a commercial property you can deduct 1 39th of the value that you of the purchase value and that's how the charts and then there's something called the mid-year i learned this from the from my ccim the commercial <laughs> certified commercial Absolute. investment manager so i learned the basics i don't know i'm not an expert well, by any means but i just know the generalities of absolutely it. but basically the concept is so if you have a commercial property and you spend two million dollars for for you can depreciate 1 39th of that two million more or less i mean absolutely yeah so that's a beauty that's a that's a found um that's a found um uh savings right absolutely it, and it could be a large amount and the mid-year concept comes from the fact if you bought the property let's say in june or july or august how much the depreciation going to be for the first year that we could use the either the mid-year approach or just one quarter's approach. Ah. So even though we are going to be using it on 39 years, but just for the first year, do I use the full year? Do I use the half year? Yeah. Do I use one fourth of the year? That's where we use either the mid-year. We don't really go with the dates. We don't really say July 17th to December 31st. We'll say half year. Half year, right. So this is all great stuff for investors. And this is all all these are tax deductible every year that they're that they're deriving rental income, whether it be a commercial property or it be a um, um, a residential property. Now we should say something that I learned from taking again the course I took. With the good, there's always nothing is perfect in life. So when you go to sell these properties, yes. there's something where there's something called the depreciation tax. That all that I learned this from doing my charts and going through and doing this on a commercial property. That it gets it gets a little and people don't understand it. But all that depreciation depreciation you paid, the IRS, you can deduct it from your, it gets back, it gets added into your basis, so it, it affects your gain, but also they, the IRS, they take that depreciation, they sum total it, and then you, I think it was like 25% of what you claimed in depreciation, the IRS gets it, when you sell it, they, they knock on your door and they say, hey, we want a little, we want tax on what, on it. It's kind of complicated. Uh, but I, uh, yes, there are, there are a couple of things here, and uh, uh, the way people think, it gets more complicated. So there is no depreciation tax first. Yeah. It's called depreciation recapture, recapture meaning yeah. uh, you have been claiming depreciation on your yeah. tax return every year. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you think about it, every year you are getting tax advantage Correct. of that expense. Advanced if you are selling money. it, then that depreciation has to be added back. Yes. You, yeah. That's not actual money. You got the tax advantage. But what a lot of people misses when you add the depreciation, 
it's a passive activity it's not an active activity unless you are a realtor unless you are spending at least 750 hours in this uh, mm -hmm. assignment so if it's a passive activity the rental losses are not deductible the way you add back the depreciation you can add back the depreciation uh, the loss is created after depreciation the rental losses that you were not able to claim all these years you can claim when you are selling the property so you have to add the depreciation back and there is no 25 percent the, the the number 25 percent comes from the fact that most people the tax bracket is around 25 percent Oh, so, so they get, they get, so, so gets added back into their. Into, it gets yeah. added back to their income, income, the, yeah. the capital gain, gain and then most of it and likely is twenty five percent. So is around twenty five percent, and that's where the theory comes from. The twenty five percent, right? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Wow, very, that's very interesting point. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But still, all in all, said, in, I mean, investing in property, commercial and residential, is a very has a lot of favorable tax absolutely. benefits. And when you sell it, you can. There's, you know, it's not the end of the world. You just have to, uh, you just have to remember that you have to consider that, so you. Know when it's the right time for you when a person to sell based on their individual uh, tax situation. It can especially in the turbulent markets that we have today. The stock market is acting up. One day it's high, one day it's low. Yeah. This is the time when people should consider investing into real estate. Yes. The market is still good for the real estate, especially on the investment side and especially on the commercial side. The prices are not that bad. Prices are still still pretty good. Reasonable. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. This is very good point. Right. I have a client and um, they were going to sell the investment property. I asked them the same thing. I said, I'm not your accountant because depreciation will be added back. I'm not accountant. Please talk to your accountant. And after she talked to the accountant, I lost the listing. She said, Jane, you're absolutely <laughs> right. I can't yeah. sell because but she planning next year she's going to retire. So, because this year her tax bracket is high. Right. So she said, you know, don't worry, I'll call you next year. No. I said, well, as agent, he said, well, that's a good agent. I said, that's what we should do. Absolutely. We should advise yeah. you, Great. you know, yep. what's the best for you. All right, yes. good stuff. Why don't we take a short break and we'll be right back after these messages. Absolutely. Okay, welcome back to our show. We're continuing with our special guest, AJ Kumar, a certified public accountant. Uh, so we've covered some of the stuff with residential investing. Um, while we're still on that topic, I know we said that we normally say real estate is normally a passive investment. Um, there are class of, there are times when real estate could be viewed as a active investment and you could be subject to a higher tax bracket. And that those cases would be when the uh, IRS views the taxpayer as a um, as a, a real estate professional. And I guess like you touched upon, AJ, I think they have to have like devote 750 hours uh, towards, you know, managing the property and they have to meet a whole bunch of other criteria. You can still be, uh, you can be a, you can be manage your own properties and and certainly still classify it as a passive investment. But if you meet a series of criteria, you become the active uh investor, right? Uh, absolutely, Ken. You're 100% right. The, I want to clarify for our audience, being active is not bad. Being active is actually good. It does not change your income tax bracket. Active income or passive income, both charged at the same income tax bracket. The difference is when you have the losses. Passive losses can only offset passive income. Active losses can offset anything. So if you have the option to be active, in this business, you want to be considered active. A lot of people will cheat on their tax return. See, IRS has a, a very little room to, to see if you're really spending 750 hours or not. If you have the realtor license, you may be doing 10 different jobs, but you still say, no, 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 really, AJ, no, no, I spend 100 hours every month. Oh, that's so, so, so people will go out of their way to be considered active. Ah. Act, being active uh, in the real estate business allows you to claim certain losses that will not be allowed or will be suspended, will be allowed later on when you sell the property or when you have the, the passive income. So people try hard. People will try to go in the gray area to be considered as active investor right. or active person as opposed to passive. Right. And let me add something. Accountants, uh, the laws are like you need to be an attorney because with every rule I found, even taking the course I took on it, there's an exception. And there's something yes, absolutely. passive. There, they have something. I don't know if the if the um, the uh, earnings are still correct, but it was said that passive loss, losses, like you said, are normally limited to three thousand uh, dollars. Right? You can only you can only offset passive losses with passive gains up to three thousand. But if your adjusted gross income is between 
screen is is a hundred thousand or less, you can deduct more. But then it you could but it phases out in, if your income reaches I think one hundred fifty thousand. No, well, that's, no, it, that's a different concept. Oh, that's a different concept. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that's passive good, passive loss doesn't have that limit. Okay, the capital loss has a limit oh, of cap- three. Th- okay, that's what it was. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I got Ken, you. stay with the real estate, <laughs> right. please. Uh, that's why a good I, accountant exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah, that's why. You see, stay with we, 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 we know. We know that we do well, the that's best. Why we have AJ here to guide us. Right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, that's a different. Yes. Let's talk about another topic, which is a lot of my clients very interested. Because in the past few years, Ken and I represent a lot of investors. In the heydays, we up to probably 150 properties. Now it's still around 100. So a lot of people do ask me about exchange. So, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So we're gonna, let's talk about the 1031 exchange. Basically, what it covers it, uh, with real estate and and the the uh, time uh, timetable when you have to when you have to make the exchange and when you have to acquire the uh, the additional property. Uh, absolutely, can. So 1031 exchange, as the name says, exchange is for exchanging the property. 1031 exchange now has been limited to real estate only. It used to be allowed for any type of asset. You could sell the vehicle by another vehicle. You could sell the copy machine by another copy machine. All those type of exchanges are not tax exempt anymore. So 1031 is the the IRC rule on the Internal Revenue Code, the, the Section 1031 refers to this code. That's why it's popularly known as 1031 Exchange. The rule is if you buy a property by selling a property, in theory, you're really not buying, you're not selling, you're just exchanging one property for the other property. And in that case, you don't have to pay the capital gain tax on selling the property. The, the property that you are selling for. There are certain rules, there are certain documents you have to file, uh, certain documents, certain paperwork you have to manage. Uh, but in theory, when you are selling the property only to buy something similar, mm-hmm. and similar can be defined as investment property versus investment property. Say, for example, if I'm selling a investment property, I cannot use that money to buy a primary home. If I'm selling my primary home and if I were to buy to that money, if I use that money to buy an investment property, that's not similar transaction. But if I have an apartment building, I sell the apartment building to buy a strip mall, that will be okay. Because this is still an investment property for me. I'm a passive investor selling one type of property to buy another type of property. That will still be allowed. Right. So the 1031 exchange, you have to you have to buy you have to exchange like kind real estate, but like kind real estate is interpreted uh, broadly as long as so you can have an investment in in uh, apartment building and you can translate that into a single commercial building or a strip mall. That's that's allowed. Or I didn't even How know this. How about Wait. if you sell the uh, um, apartment exchange to a, a hotel? Well, uh, think about it. An apartment wouldn't be giving you enough money to buy the hotel. But in theory, if you have an apartment building. Yeah, the building, the, I mean. Then you yeah. have, you are an invest passive investor. Yeah. You don't live in that apartment no, building. No. That's not your primary home. Yes. And hotel is nothing but an apartment building, a fancy apartment building where you, ca- where you are renting the rooms by the day as opposed to by the month. So they're the same. So, so, it's, it's, so in theory, they are still investment property yeah. for you as an investor. Right. Okay. And if somebody wants to do a 1031 exchange, they have to go through a um, like a holding company, right? It has to be a qualified or licensed. Uh, they company. have to go through an attorney. A lot of attorneys have the can do this work. It's a, it's a simple paperwork. You have the the key uh, in this 1031 exchange is when you sell the property, when you are selling the first property, the money must stay in the escrow account. The money cannot come into your account. If money comes into your account, then you can you do not qualify for 1031 exchange. So the money remains in the either the holding company, you can use a 1031 holding company, or you can use your attorney. If the same attorney is doing the transaction for both properties for you, you must identify the property within 60 days of selling the first property and must close on the new property, on the second property, the exchange property, within six months, and you cannot touch the money. Mm-hmm. The money must remain with the holding company, with the escrow account. The question typically we get, let's say if I sold the property for $1 million, mm-hmm. the next property that I'm buying is not $1 million, is only half a million dollar. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. Then how do I go about it? 
can I still use 1031 exchange? We'll see the cost basis over here versus the gains over here and we'll give you the tax exemption for partial amount. Mm -hmm. So in this example that we are taking, half of the gain will be considered as a 1031 exchange and you can choose to pay the taxes on remaining half of the gain. What we are saying is, it's not either all or none. I yeah. see, okay. Uh -huh. But uh, the caveat is, if money comes into your bank account, then all the deal is off. Okay. Gotcha. Or let's say what happens if you delay the 1031, ex the, the closing, it normally has to be six months per the rule, but let's say it, it, it delays and doesn't occur for seven months. Uh, is it still recognized as 1031 and you're subject to a penalty where the IRS would get some of the uh, tax money or would the whole deal be considered non eligible? Well, it depends on the situation. It depends yep. on the fact pattern. If the money stayed with the attorney and you had everything that you did, yep. you can still qualify for the 1031 exchange, but the rule is six months. In theory, IRS can still audit you, still come back to you that it's not 1031 exchange. They can still deny your transaction as a 1031 transaction and hold you responsible for the capital gain. And taxes. then it becomes a fact-specific uh, case Absolutely. determination where depending on all the particulars of the situation, uh, if there was good faith effort and you know what happened uh, to absolutely. what caused the delay. And here's another uh, question I have. Let's say you do a 1031 exchange, uh, you sell uh, building A, commercial building A, and, and uh, you uh, exchange it for commercial building B, and then uh, a year later you want to exchange commercial building B for commercial building C. Can you con can you continue the uh, 1031? Absolutely. You, you are allowed to continue as many times. The, the caveat is, uh, think about it, why would the government allow it? Why would the government not go out of their way to try to charge the capital gain? So what they're doing is your cost basis remains same. Let's, let's take an example. You bought a property for $100,000. Then you're selling it for half a million and you're buying another property for half a million. The property that you just bought for half a million through 1031 exchange, we consider that you bought that property for only $100,000. Ah, your cost basis. In the other words, cost basis is, is only one hundred thousand. Now you did the you sold building B to building C. You sold building B for one million dollar to buy another building for a million dollar. The building C that you just bought for a million dollar, your cost basis is only one hundred thousand. So you're, you're so when you if if and when you sell building if, C, you your, see, your taxability will would be roughly nine hundred thousand. Unless if you sell building C for one point one million, you cannot say I bought it for one million. Why are you yeah. charging me for hundred thousand yeah. dollars? Because now you sold the property for one point one million building C, so your gain is one million dollar, not one hundred thousand dollars in this example. That's very important for the audience. Yes. Yes. That, so you're just pushing the gain. You're delayed. You're delayed. You're, you're, de you're differing yeah, the gain. Deferring. The differing the taxes only because you did not touch the money. You right. the money came from here. Money went there directly. It's an exchange of the property. Your out of pocket expenses were what you paid for building A. That was one hundred thousand dollars in our example. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. About how long have 1031 exchanges been on the books for the IRS? They have always been there. I mean, as far as I can remember, I, I, the last major change that IRS had was in 1984. Uh, after that, 1035 exchange was more popular than 1031 exchange at one point of time, where people were changing the insurance policy. If you consider the whole life insurance policy, they have a lot of value in there because they have large premium, monthly premium, and people were allowed to exchange the policy under 1035 exchange. But now all those things have been stopped. Only now the exchange is only allowed for real estate properties. No asset, no machine, no vehicle, only the real estate. Wow, interesting. Simple. Well, but it's good, at least it applies to real estate. At, at least has. it does. I'm, I'm glad it still applies to real estate. Yeah, excellent. Hopefully that continues. Somebody talk about they may take it away, but we haven't heard anything yet about the 1031. Well, knowing the government, they can take away anything, anytime. But uh, under the current government, we are not hoping any more uh, tax benefits taking away. Yeah. Okay. All great information. Unfortunately, we're out of time again, Sanjay. So once again, can you please share with the listeners your uh, contact information? Uh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. AJ Kumar, CPA. I can be contacted at 908-380-6876. Again, the phone number is 908-380-6876. Okay, once again, AJ, thank you so much for coming on our show. And we're going to see everyone next week. Have a great weekend. Thank you. If you thank have you. any questions, please call AJ directly. Thank, thank you. Thank you.